The festive season is upon us, and with it comes glee. From good food, joyous laughter, and decorating the tree. But this Christmas was different for one girl on this eve. For the thing she valued most had to miss her and leave. But the father of Christmas truly knows that love does prevail above all else like a hand from above. So enjoy this sweet tale about a family and their man. Now lie back and take a deep breath. Welcome to Snooze with Sam. There was not a moment to lose, for it had been a long year of preparation, and it was time to make haste. As far as he could tell, everything was in place and packed as efficiently as possible. The reindeer were shackled and rearing to go. The huge sack filled with gifts was secured and stable, and the sleigh was a sight to behold. He stood there, hands on his plump waist, admiring everything before him. He was as proud and joyous as anyone could possibly have been, and with a glint in his eye, he felt an immense rush of excitement and anticipation at the long night ahead. Far, far into the North Pole, on a chilly Christmas Eve, A light blizzard blew across the soft and glistening snow underfoot. The night sky shone with a thousand twinkling stars, and a sliver of a moon could be seen through wispy clouds. Thinking carefully, whilst stroking his big white beard. From out of an open door of a warm wooden chalet, shuffling through the snow towards him, was Mrs. Claus, wrapped up all cosy to keep out the cold. Is everything all right, Santa? Do you need anything else before you go? Oh no, my darling. You've done more than enough as it is. Honestly, I don't know what I'd do without you. Santa Claus spun on the spot and rushed over to Mrs. Claus, sweeping her clean off her feet in a spinning frenzy of giggles. She embraced him and snuggled into his huge red coat. She smiled up at him, eyes glinting under the starlight. 
Now, are you sure? You see, last year you nearly forgot your specs. And that would have been no use at all, because you wouldn't have been able to see where you were going. Right enough, dear. But I, I think we've got everything we need, and we're ready to go. All thanks to you. Got your hat? Aye, it's on my head. Remember to lift the flask of tea? Wouldn't forget that. Absolute travel essentials. Keys and wallet? Aye, they're in the glove box. Did you pack these sandwiches I made you? Aye, I did indeed. Emergency cheese sandwiches to be had only in the event of a global mince pie shortage. Santa Claus patted his belly with certitude, to which Mrs. Claus nodded gently with approval. Are the reindeers all well? How's Dasher's foot? He stubbed his hoof on the gate the other day. Both Mr. and Mrs. Claus spun around to admire the deer. The Eclectic Eight, that's what they called them. With such a range of characters, requirements, and causes of tantrum, there really was nothing else to call them as a group. The two rows of four were lined out perfectly, reins and holsters keeping them arranged. They all looked both majestic and resolute. At the back, there were clumsy Dasher and Dancer, then Prancer and Vixen, followed by Cupid and Donner, and finally Blitzen and Rudolph, with his shiny red nose leading the entourage. They bucked a little, straining at the reins, fully fed watered, and keen to take to the air. That much was obvious. They grunted and groaned, evidently giving Santa Claus the hurry up. They'll be fine, my dear. I'll look after them, and they'll look after me. They have done for many years, and there'll be no change there, if I've got anything to do with it. Okay then, what about your lists? Are they safe? Santa reached into his back pocket, and withdrew a couple of neatly folded letters. He supposed that there was little else to do than run through the list one more time for good measure. Mrs. Claus pulled out her own checklist to cross-reference, and so Santa proceeded to peer down his rosy nose, holding a list labelled Extra Wonderful and generous at arm's length to try and get a focus on the small writing. My, my, this list seems to grow more and more every year, which is a good thing, I suppose. Right. Keep me right, Mrs. Claus. Here I have Aaliyah Allison L. Alison, Alyssa, Andrea, Anessa, Ari, 
Barbara Brunt, Candy Caro, Caroline Caro, Celia Christine T, Christine Y, Christy, Cindy Connor, Dale D, Deborah, Diane I, Diane W, Drew Shark, and Dr. Connie. Blimey, that's not even the half of it. There have been so many incredibly wonderful and generous boys and girls this year. Have you got Ellie, L. Smith, Gadget, Hecky, Isabel, Jamie, J.A., Jan, Jan, D, J, Jen, Jennifer, Jessica, Jodine, Julie B, Julie C, Caitlin, Karen F, Karen E, Karen M, Carly, Kathleen F, Kathleen K, Kathleen S M, Kelly, Chris, Lara Stella, Laurie Beach, and Lou. Hi. They're all there. Isn't this wonderful, Santa? There's so many amazing people in this world. Well, Hen, we're, we're not done yet. Next we have Maria, Melanie, Melissa, B, Melissa R, Megan, Michelle, Molly, Olivia, Peppa, Petra, Rachel, Randy, Rebecca, B, Rebecca F, Rebecca N, Rick, Scott, Shana Ann, Sunny, Sue Ellen, Tara L, Tara M, Teresa, Terry, Teresa B, Tracy L, and White Roses. Oh. That's everyone, I think. It's going to be a busy night. And I can't wait to get started. Well, I'll not keep you back any longer. Just please be safe and come home soon. I will, dear, I promise. I love you dearly. I love you too, my cuddly wee Santa. With one final embrace, Santa Claus about turned and strode across to the sleigh where the reindeer were waiting patiently. He had one big black boot inside the sleigh when he began patting his jacket and trousers, then turned back towards the cabin. Oh, sugar. Mrs. Claus, my specs. I nearly forgot them again. They're on your head. He fumbled a gloved hand around on his hat, feeling for his spectacles, which he eventually found, stowing them safely in his top pocket. <laughs> Thank you, my darling. That's why I married you. And so, finally, Santa Claus climbed into his sleigh and checked everything one final time. He glanced back across to the love of his life, who had since been joined by dozens of of happy wee elves who'd come out to wave him off before whispering to his reindeer. In an instant, their eyes lit up with glee, and before he even had a chance to steady himself, Santa and his sleigh were launched across the snow at pace. 
barely hanging on and laughing hysterically to himself, he pulled firmly back on the reins and soared the reindeer into the night sky. A trail of glittering snow leapt from the runners and beneath the moonlight a curtain of sparkles glistened above Mrs. Claus and the elves. Santa circled the sleigh, rejoicing in the harmony that existed between him and his reindeer, watching his wonderful team down on the snow. He waved a final wave down below and shot off into the Christmas night. At Christmas, those we love don't go away. They walk beside us every day. Unseen, unheard, but always near. So loved, so missed, so very dear. Bedtime usually came far too early for most children, but things tended to be different on Christmas Eve. At least, that is exactly what Rose usually felt, as her mum gently ushered her into her bed, helping her settle down for the night on a stormy, blizzarding Blackhill Farm in snowy, rural Scotland. Rose normally couldn't wait to get to sleep, because the sooner she could sleep, the sooner Santa Claus would visit, and the sooner Christmas Day would come. And she adored Christmas Day. She loved waking up early, eyes bright and full of glee, and running across to the fireplace where she'd left out some mince pies, milk and carrots for the reindeer the night before. Without fail, They'd either be gone, with barely a crumb left, or very obviously nibbled, probably just depending on how much they'd already eaten that night. Next, she would scurry through to her parents' bedroom, snuggle between them, and start to open her wee presents which Santa had left her. If she didn't forget, though, first she would reach up onto the counter and click the kettle on for them, because she knew that both her mum and dad would be very sleepy and need their wakey-wakey juice to feel a bit better. Despite it being so early, sometimes as often as 5.30 in the morning, 
Rose's parents would happily let her embrace everything that was so special about being a child on Christmas. They enjoyed watching her enjoy herself as much as anything else. But this year, Rose wasn't so excited to go to bed, and her mother knew it, seeing the look in her daughter's eyes. The wee girl was only five years old, and hardly spoke a word at the best of times. Very shy, but extraordinarily conscientious, she observed and watched most of the time. She'd started school earlier in the year, and tended to keep herself to herself. She had a couple of friends, who she found similar qualities in, and was quite close with. But still, she said little, opting to communicate more readily with gestures or acts of kindness. Her parents had always been a little concerned and aware of her nature, but over time they'd become content that this was just her preferred way of living in her wee world. But on this night, Rose had hardly said anything at all as there was something very important missing. Her mother helped tuck her in, placing a wee cup of water on her bedside table. A warm and soft glowing lamp shone little star shapes all around the room and ceiling. It was Rose's favourite thing, and she liked to pretend that she was a space explorer on an incredible adventure. Stroking her hair, Rose's mother smiled at her with an expression full of understanding. It's okay, my wee darling. I know you miss him. But he'll be home very soon. In fact, he said he'd call before bedtime to say goodnight. Just as her mother finished these words, Rose heard a gentle ring from the next room. In that moment, her mother skipped through and retrieved her phone, answering it on the way back in. Rose heard her father's voice and sat up a little in her bed with hopeful eyes. Her mum chatted to him briefly before settling the screen on Rose's bed, so she could see her father's face. Hi Rose, Merry Christmas Eve, her father said, dressed in smart attire from a luminous grand office. This must have been the publisher's headquarters. How's my wee girl doing? I heard you went out to play in the snow earlier. Did you make lots of snow angels? Did you chase the sheep? Aye, they're pretty fast, aren't they? 
don't worry. You and me will catch one one day soon. We just need the dream team, that's all. Are you, are you excited for Christmas? And for Santa Claus visiting? Rosa's father couldn't help but stutter a little when he said this, as he stifled back a lump in his throat. This was the first time he'd had to work away at Christmas and leave his darling wife and daughter back in Scotland. Sometimes, circumstances seemed to dictate things, and this was one of those times, but it hardly made it any easier to be apart knowing that he wouldn't be there to share the experience they so loved. How's New York, dear? Rosa's mother asked. Oh, you know, it's not too bad. Huge. Very different to our Scotland. But it's a spectacle, that's for sure. Here. Rose, look at this. I've just sent something. It's a photo of the view from the hotel they've got me staying in. It's called the, um, the, the Pierre, and it looks over Gapstow Bridge in Central Park. It's far too fancy for your old da. As wonderful as it is, I'd much rather be there with you both. I'm sorry I'm not there, Rose. But I'll, I'll be home in a few days. Just look after your mother. And I love you to the moon and back. Oh, and I almost forgot. Where's, where's your best friend at? Are they keeping you company? Where's our Morag? She must have heard her name, because almost on cue, Rose and her mum peered over the end of the bed to see their wee ginger cat, Morag, run across the floor and jump up onto the bed. She padded up to Rose, snuggling up against her neck and giving a wee purr of contentedness. Oh, there she is. There's my three girls. Don't know what I'd do without you all. Her father said with a shine in his eyes which gave away his heartache. The girl's mother saw this and thinking it best to let everyone be and call it a night, allowed them a final good night to each other before she left the room and said her own to her husband. Rose didn't know what to feel. She was excited for Christmas, but would it be the same? Without her dad, she wasn't sure. At least she had Morag there, who she softly stroked and cuddled. She loved Morag dearly, and Morag loved her too. All things said and done, they were bestest friends and inseparable. A few moments later, Rose's mother came back to the bedroom and kissed Rose on the forehead. Your dad asked me to give you that before you slept. Wait, is everything ready then? She asked with a smile, doing her best to cheer Rose up. 
They both looked through the door into the living room, where the wood-burning fireplace crackled healthily. On the hearth, as usual, Rose had placed no fewer than eight carrots for the reindeer. But not only this, no, no, beside them was a homemade spiced mince pie and a glass of milk for Santa. She didn't know what happened during the night, but she'd never properly seen him before. She thought she'd heard his sleigh land on the roof once, but when she got up to look out of the window, all she saw was a glint of something flying away across the moon. She didn't know whether she'd seen it or had been dreaming, but still, the memory was there. She'd wondered about the fireplace and the chimney and how Santa would get down if it was blazing. Her mum had reassured her, Santa's got magic powers, and he can put out and relight a fire quite easily so that he can come down safely. This made sense to Rose, so she felt assured enough that the fireplace wouldn't pose a hazard. On the mantelpiece, her wee stocking hung ready to be filled with goodies, and across the room their Christmas tree glowed with hundreds of beautiful fairy lights and decorations. Everything was set. With a final tuck of blankets, and another kiss. Rose's mother wished her good night, turned off the starry lamp, leaving the door cracked to allow some light from the fireplace in. She laid there, recalling the letter she'd sent to Santa Claus a few days ago. Her mum had promised to post it. She hoped she did. Rose's thoughts then shifted to soaring through space as an astronaut, and soon, with Morag curled up next to her, she fell fast asleep. Racing through the stars, at light speed she zoomed. Rose dreamed of space travel on the rockets that boomed. Huge planets and moons and comets she saw. So many colours and shapes that left her in awe. But she wasn't alone. There was no doubt of that, for pulling her rocket was Morag the cat. Then space turned to New York, flying right up Broadway, as Morag led her through the sky, just like Santa's sleigh.
A few hours had passed since Santa Claus left the North Pole, and he was making decent progress as he'd hoped. High up in the sky, he rubbed his hands together, blowing hot air between his gloves to generate a little more heat in the bitter cold. He thought about cracking open Mrs. Claus's tea flask, but thought it better to save it for the icier parts of the world. Glancing down into the footwell of his sleigh, he extended an arm to feel for hot air blowing at his feet, then proceeded to optimistically twiddle the knobs on the dashboard in a vain effort to produce more warmth. I've got to get a bigger heater matrix in this thing. I swear these winters are getting colder, Rudolf. Rudolf and the rest of the troop glanced back with mild scorn, for they themselves were feeling the chill more than him, no doubt. Realising his misplaced remark, Santa sighed, resigning himself to a cold night ahead, but found comfort in the idea of his next refueling stop. Picking up his map from the seat next to him, he refreshed his memory of where they'd been and where was still to visit. Their last stop was Naples in Italy, and before then he'd crossed off Sydney, Singapore, Saigon, Mumbai, Kabul, Jerusalem, Budapest, Vienna, and Brussels, among hundreds and thousands more places in the Eastern Hemisphere. Spotting the next stop on the map, he smiled as he called up to his reindeer and gently tugged on the left rein to pull them into a steady dive from the clear night sky to down below the clouds. The air rushed around them and the chill factor seemed to increase for a large moment, but they soon burst through the cloud layer below, and before them stood the spectacle of the city of love, Paris. Eiffel Tower standing proudly, covered in a thin layer of snow crystals. Santa had always had a fondness of Paris. He took Mrs. Claus there on honeymoon, and he reveled in the next short while, checking his list, stopping off at every house, and leaving all the lovely children with gifts and joyous tidings. House after house, snow-covered roof after snow-covered roof, Santa and his reindeer companions soared silently through the night, landing gracefully and without so much as a sound. Santa would grab his enormous sack of gifts and plunge himself down the chimneys with ease, not forgetting his trusty fire blanket to reduce the charring on his suit. Still, to this day, Santa scratched his head about why the people of the world still lit their fires when they knew fine well that he'd need access down the chimney. 
They must have been under some illusion that he somehow had magic powers in which to douse and reignite a billion fires on command. Alas, he surely wished he was able to, for it would save a lot of effort in tobogganing down every chimney on a fire blanket. It was not a foolproof solution, however, as he would still singe a cheek every now and again if he landed awkwardly. Checking the lists and handwritten letters, he'd fish around in the sack for gifts, leave them in their stockings and under the Christmas trees, and then nibble on anything the children had been generous enough to leave for him. Acting quickly, in case he disturbed anyone, he'd then scoot up the chimney and back up to his reindeer, and feed them their well-earned carrots, and occasionally a mince pie. Some chimneys were a tighter squeeze than others, and they all seemed to grow smaller as the night drew on. He supposed, if he was being very honest, this was likely down to the milk, cookies, and mince pies, which he gladly received. Throughout the night, all across the globe, Santa Claus would repeat this process thousands of times, making sure to not miss a single soul. Beneath the moon and the stars, flying northwards towards the upper reaches of Europe, he glanced down at his watch, which handily had 24 individual time zones, and he noted that, at that present moment and location, it was 11.43pm. Perfect. They were right on schedule. Santa Claus was feeling very content, and checked in with his reindeer regularly to ensure they were also. Another brief glance down at his map revealed their next stop. It was another place he held very close to his heart, but he seldom let anyone know. It was a little secret between Santa and Mrs. Claus, which most of the world knew nothing about. He whispered another quiet word to his reindeer, and without even needing to pull on their reins, they grunted happy and excited grunts and began their descent. In the middle of the night, a bump stirred her from her dream. Rose peered from her bed towards the light gleam. No movement, no sound, just the glow from the tree. What was it that woke her? Could it possibly be? Then a noise from above, like a shuffle of hooves, and then followed grunting, something struggled to move. There was someone next door, that 
was definitely what it was. Could it really be the old man, Santa Claus? The wee girl slipped out of bed, as quietly as a mouse, and, whilst doing so, stirred Morag from her snoozes. She followed Rose instantly, hopping down from the bed, and stretched her back whilst on the floor. Still. There were very quiet rustles and sounds of shuffling across the floor. Then came the sounds of quiet munching and satisfied noises of gratification. Step by step, she tiptoed across her bedroom floor towards the door where, through the gap, she saw that the fire had gone out, though was still glowing, and her stocking, which had been hanging loose and empty when she went to sleep, was now full and brimming with wee gifts, all wrapped neatly. Only the soft, Draping glow from the Christmas tree lights made any of this visible. As she moved closer and closer to the doorway, she saw a shadow cross the fireplace. It looked big and tall, with something pointy on its head. Could it really be? Although five years old, and full of imagination and unflappable belief, Rose could still not allow herself to assume anything. She reached for the door handle, and pulled it open a little further. Morag close behind her for support. Together, counting to three in her head, Rose rounded the door frame. They both stood there, Rose and Morag, motionless unable to believe what they were seeing. Perhaps it was the presence of an unknown stranger, or something truly magical in the air, but Morag let out a wee involuntary meow of curious inquisition. This sound made the tall stranger Dressed head to toe in a white fur-lined red suit, turn on the spot. Their shiny black boots squeaked lightly on the hardwood floor as the white bearded man slowly rotated 180 degrees to see what the noise was. He looked as confused and perplexed as Morag did to see the pair of them stood there by the fire. For in one hand was held half a mince pie, 
The other half, evidently mid-consumption, his plump cheeks and crumbs in his beard gave that away, and in his other hand was held a glass of milk, half empty. A few moments passed, where nobody made a sound or moved a muscle. Eventually, the rosy-cheeked old man smiled and gently waved a gloved hand. Subtly, with his pie hand, he reached for and peered down at his extra wonderful and generous list, and quickly reacquainted himself. Rose, he thought, but beside her name was written in Mrs. Claus's writing, please see attached document. And on the back of the list, under subcategory Scotland, was a letter. It was addressed to him, as they all were, and on it was written in childish handwriting, Dear Santa, Merry Christmas. Are all the elves okay? Don't they get cold up there at the North Pole? Hopefully they have scarves. For Christmas, all I wish is to have my dad back with me, Mum and Morag. He is working in New York. Thank you, and say... Hello to Mrs. Claus, spelled C-L-A-W-S. Love, Rose. In only those few moments, Santa's thoughts whirled around in a blizzard and came upon an idea which he'd wanted to do for years but never thought it wise. You must be Rose. How lovely to meet you. The wee girl nodded, subtly, still with weary eyes and deafening silence across her lips. Oh, who's your wee friend down there? This must be... Morag, is it? She's gorgeous. I've got a couple of cats up at the North Pole too. Not many people know that, but what's a busy, bustling workshop without a cat or two keeping everyone company? He said with tenderness and a wink. You must be wondering who I am, or perhaps you already know. Well, yes, it is me. I am Santa Claus. Thank you for welcoming me into your home, and especially for leaving out the delicious mince pie. Santa said this whilst shamelessly popping the other half into his mouth, clearly savouring every last morsel. Rose smiled, overjoyed that he appreciated what they left. Morag began to purr and rubbed herself first on Rose's leg though the tip of her tail almost reached Rose's shoulder, and then went over to Santa Claus and returned the same favour. 
Santa Claus bent down, gave her a wee scratch behind the ear, and continued. I hope you don't mind, but I've left a few wee things under the tree for you, Morag, your mother, and someone else special. Which has me wondering, Rose. A wee elf told me that there was something else you really wanted for Christmas. Is that right? Perhaps someone who you'd like to be here. Rose could do little else but grin excitedly at the implication of her father, only to follow immediately with a tiny sigh of despair, as she knew that it was impossible, and clearly Santa didn't understand the situation. Her dad was in New York. There was no way that he could come back. Seeing this, Santa understood how she felt. He took to a knee by the Christmas tree and spoke softly. Rose, what would you think if I said I was able to bring you to your father for Christmas? Would you like that? The wee girl shuffled on the spot, unsure what to make of Santa's proposition. What did he mean? How would that be possible? You see, what I'm thinking is this. Myself and the reindeer have a lot more work to do tonight. We're still to cross the Atlantic to deliver gifts to all the children in the Western Hemisphere, including New York. As he said this, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a little movement by the archway to the living room, and saw Rose's mum standing there in her dressing gown, half hidden so as not to disturb the moment. She had a warm grin on her face, and nodded gently as if to go on. Santa smiled back to her, and then looked back to Rose. You see, what I am suggesting, dear Rose, is because I can't bring your father to you. Perhaps I could take you to see your dad in New York. With your mother's permission, of course. Santa Claus glanced back in the direction of Rose's mother, who nodded with a smile and expression which said, Go on then, if you have to. But underneath it was clear, she was as excited as anyone at the idea of Rose being able to see her father. She knew how much it meant to her daughter. Rose saw the two of them exchanging communications, and she turned to her mum with bright eyes, holding out her hand. Then she looked questioningly back towards Santa, then her mum, then to Morag at her feet, then back to Santa, her face full of hope. Oh, crikey, what am I thinking? 
Of course we can take your dear mother and Morag. We wouldn't want them to be left out, would we? The sleigh's got plenty of room in it for all the family. Seven seats, big boot, and a decent sound system as well. Hearing this, Rose laughed and skipped around at the news of being able to take Morag and her mum with them. She couldn't believe it. Was she really going to go on Santa's sleigh? Could that really be happening? After everything, would she possibly be reunited with her dad? The wee lassie could hardly contain her excitement, and Morag meowed in agreement. Santa ushered Rose forward so he could talk quietly to her. Now, Rose, there's something very important I need to ask you. I'm not supposed to do this. I promised Mrs. Claus years ago not to involve anyone in Christmas Eve. But your letter touched my soul, my dear. You see, I grew up not too far from here, just like you. And I'll never forget the first time my own father had to leave for Christmas. I know how it feels, Rose. And I think Mrs. Claus will understand. So, can you keep this a secret between us? Rose nodded sincerely, absorbing every word. Santa Claus winked at her in a bond of trust, stood up, reaching for the sack of gifts, then addressed Rose, her mother, and Morag. Right, you three, make sure you're all wrapped up warm. It's awful chilly out there. I may need a wee helping hand along the way too, but don't worry, it won't be too long before we reach America. Who wants to meet the reindeer? Holding hands snugly and wrapped up all warm, Santa led them up the chimney and out into the storm. The wee girl, she paused, unable to believe, eight reindeer before her, her eyes could not conceive. Rudolph's nose so bright and shiny and red, she approached the lead reindeer and stroked his soft head Santa ushered them to the sleigh, preparing for flight, and with a swift pull of the reins, off they flew into the night. After only moments, the reindeer and the sleigh burst through the uppermost cloud layer and out into the inky night sky. Rose, her mother and Morag were cuddled up together on the back seat, 
all toasty thanks to a thick woolen blanket. None of them could believe that they were soaring above the clouds, with a star-scattered night sky above their heads, with none other than Santa Claus at the helm of the reins. He turned to smile at them, just to make sure that they were all okay. They peered down over the edge of the sleigh, reveling in the stunning views of luminous, moonlit clouds. It didn't feel real to any of them. Everything they saw seemed more like a painting than reality. Rose wondered what Morag was making of all this. And right enough, Morag's eyes were wide with excitement and awe. For never in the name of chasing woolly maggots did she ever think that her, a wee ginger farm cat, would ever be up in the sky, soaring with the clouds. The closest she'd ever been to them before that point was watching them float gently by from her favourite spot, high up on the dry stone wall. Then, suddenly, all of them were pulled from their thoughts as something marvellous happened. Off to the north, something danced and drifted like a waterfall of colours. It was as clear as anything they'd ever seen, and the beams of reds, greens and pinks washed across the stars akin to a wave breaching the sands. They were mesmerised and watched in silence. The Northern Lights, Santa piped up after a moment. He too was fixated on the performance before them. Simply marvellous. After all these years, they never get any less beautiful. After what only seemed like a few minutes since leaving their home in Scotland, Santa turned round to the toasty three. We're about to make our first descent. From what I can see, St. John's in Newfoundland is our next stop, just beyond that cloud line over there. Then we'll be heading a little further south into Nova Scotia before heading inland a wee bitty. And then, well, then we'll need to wait and see. He said this with a cheeky wee smile. I hope you're ready to lend me a hand. There's a whole sack to gift the wonderful boys and girls, just like you, Rose. And so, just as they had done a thousand times earlier that night, Santa directed his reindeer back down through the clouds and aimed for the first specks of light sticking out on a protruding headland. Swiftly, he brought the sleigh down onto the first roof with a scarcely believable grace. It was like a feather landing on the water. 
neither Rose, her mother, or Morag felt a thing. Santa then ushered everyone out, helping them down the chimney, and handed them gifts and helpful instructions to ensure all of the children were catered for. Helping Santa with the heavy work, Rose made sure to place the wee parcels gently underneath the tree, taking great care not to crumple up the gorgeous wrapping paper and ribbons. Morag then helped Rose, carrying the smaller parcels in her mouth, one at a time, whilst Rose's mum carefully packed their stockings, which hung over the fireplace. They were the perfect team, and Santa couldn't help but wish Mrs. Claus was there to share this moment. After a million houses or so, Santa caught a glimpse of Rose scribbling on a wee piece of paper and popping it into a stocking from a stash in her jacket. Smiling sweetly, she then hurried off and Santa helped everyone back up the chimney. Before he followed, though, he took a curious glance at the note she left. It read, Please remember what matters most at Christmas. P.S. Santa's real. Rose was some wee cherub. What a special child. As much as it was his job to deliver all of these gifts to the deserving children of the world, he couldn't help agree with her. The magic of Christmas was special to a child as was their belief in him. Santa knew this was important for kids, as it helped them enjoy what it meant to be a child. But deep down, he hoped himself and had faith that all of the children would one day at least realize that above all else, it was love that mattered the most. After a moment more, Santa sighed a happy sigh and followed his team up the chimney. They jumped back into the sleigh, whooshed off into the air, and set their sights on New York. Christmas night rushed by in but a moment of time. In the silence of flight, the subtlest of chimes, from the sleigh bells which tinkled between house after house, as they landed, laid gifts, and left quiet as a mouse. And then it was time to lay eyes on her dream, for there on the horizon was somewhere that seemed so enormous, so huge, Rose was no longer sad, for they were actually here to see 
her own dark. Rose had never been to New York before, and her only impressions of this vast metropolis had been from images in the media, books, or photographs, or from her father showing her the views from his various hotels. So, nothing prepared her for the spectacle that was Manhattan's skyline. In every direction, buildings reached for the sky as high as they could. Wispy clouds glowed effervescently from the millions of lights below. The air was filled with the movement of the wealthy in helicopters, and the streets swam with cars and little ant people. No matter which direction she looked in, some iconic monument flooded her mind with a sense of familiarity and recognition. Firstly, they soared over the Statue of Liberty, which protruded out of the water, welcoming them just as it had done to people a hundred years before her. Then came the unmistakable silhouettes of Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges connecting the neighbouring borough with the bustle of Chinatown and Lower Manhattan. Zipping them up a little higher, Santa lifted their altitude for a better view of Greenwich, Chelsea and Midtown. Rose's mouth hung open in amazement, as did her mother's, to be fair. Morag simply perched with her front paws on the sleigh's edge, gazing down into the slow-motion chaos, dazzled by it all. A few weeks before, whilst getting in the mood for Christmas. Rose and her family had been snuggled up on the sofa with cinnamon hot chocolate, watching Christmas films. And in one in particular, where a child was lost in New York, she'd seen the most famous building of all the Empire State. Since then, it had been etched in her mind, but she certainly never expected to ever lay eyes on it. But then, as they swooped swiftly and silently over the skyscrapers, with both the East and Hudson Rivers to either side. There, front and centre, was the very thing she'd pictured in her imagination. But it was more than that. The iconic Art Deco Tower embodied her vision of New York and it intoxicated her. She looked up to her mother, who returned an empathetic smile. 
but that wasn't all. Just beyond, they glided over the feast for the eyes that was Times Square. A sea of screens, neon, intersections and hundreds of people, even at this hour. None of them could quite comprehend the sheer scale of Manhattan. It was bigger and more consuming than they'd ever believed. As far removed as it was from the slumber and sanctuary of sleepy Scotland, it was something new and exciting and it was beautiful. Wordlessly, Santa guided the sleigh over the rooftops, aiming for a large open space a mile or so away. Rose didn't initially recognize it, but after she realized that it was, in fact, covered in snow, it revealed in her mind the infamous Central Park. Much like everything else they'd seen so far, it too was much, much bigger than she'd imagined it to be. It stretched off into the night as far as her eyes could see. And then she realized something. Before, when her father had called her in bed, he showed her the view from his hotel room, looking out onto the same very place. Suddenly, Rose was filled with joy and apprehension. They were here. And her father, where would he be? He couldn't be far. There. There it was. The wee bridge that he'd shown her. What was it called? Gapstow or something. As if Santa was reading her mind, he turned as if to ask her where they would like to aim for. But seeing Rose's frantic pointing towards a beautiful hotel looking out over the park. He nodded understandingly and began to bring the sleigh down. As if by some magical coincidence, huge fluffy snowflakes began to fall from the clouds above, travelling quietly and softly hardly carried by a breeze. This was it. The wee girl could hardly contain herself. Both Morag and her mother clung to Rose's arms, comforting her. Now, all they had to do was find him. For wherever in this world you may roam, in my heart you will always be home. The local time was 11.57pm on Christmas Eve, 
not too long before midnight. The park was quiet and little disturbed the peace. Should one happen to not look up at the tall buildings towards the perimeters of this vast space, one might never even know of the bustle which lay beyond. And for Rose's exhausted and weary father, it was a welcome tranquillity. But the silence only reminded him of the fact he was alone. He walked through a white central park, snowflakes landing gently on the shoulders of his thick jacket, and contemplated everything. It had been a long Christmas Eve at their office, but he had finally closed on a deal to have his work published. It was a massive step forward, and it would mean great things for the future. He couldn't wait to tell his family. They'd all be very happy, but still, the nag which didn't leave him was the fact that he'd wished he didn't have to go at all. He'd felt coerced into the timing of it all, and he feared that the opportunity might slip away, and the livelihood of his family would have suffered should he have refused to cooperate, not fulfilling his part to play and all that. Was it worth it? Well, it was this he wasn't sure about. He'd seen the look in his daughter's eyes when he called. There was something missing, like a trust in him which had been lost. In that exact moment, he stopped in the middle of a snow-covered bridge spanning the pond, and pulled out a photograph of his wonderful family that he kept in his wallet. Brushing the odd snowflake off, he gazed at them all individually. Morag, of course, was front and centre. She'd been more of a friend to Rose than anyone, and was such a special cat. She was more than a cat, and goodness knows she got up to some number of adventures, most of which nobody had any clue about. Above Morag was his darling wife, who he loved and missed terribly. Over the years, their bond had strengthened and strengthened, embracing and overcoming all manner of challenges. Like any two people, they had their rough patches, but she'd supported him in his goals and ambitions as a writer, and so had he supported with hers. Together, they'd dealt with pain, loss, anguish, and joy. And eventually they healed enough to bring along Rose, who was their world. They still hadn't let Rose know that she was to become a big sister 
but in time they would tell her when they were ready. When he thought of his wee Princess Rose, he couldn't help himself but succumb to quiet tears right there on the bridge. He knew what Christmas together meant for his family, and he quietly promised that he'd not leave them ever again. Beneath the spangling lights of New York, Rose's father wished for nothing else than to be at home with his family. Something broke the silence around him, but it wasn't the sounds of the city or of car horns, music or aircraft. It was something else, and it was coming from overhead, somewhere in the gloom. Through the falling snowflakes, Rose's father strained to see something, anything. It sounded like bells, jingling bells, like the ones he and Rose would play with when she was up on his shoulders, pretending to drive him like Santa's sleigh. What happened next would change his life forever. It started out as exhausted curiosity and turned into a little bemusement. Then a lot of bemusement. Then shock and awe as out of the snowfall, he saw a soft red glow moving above the treetops. Following the red glow was what appeared to be eight dogs, or was it cows, or were they reindeer? Yes. They were reindeer, pulling a sleigh. It couldn't be, could it? No, it surely couldn't be. But yes, gliding gracefully out of the sky, lining up their landing along the frosted path, were reindeer pulling a sleigh. And at the helm of the sleigh seemed to be something impossible, something improbable, something and someone he'd never dared to have believed to exist himself in all these years. The reindeer and sleigh landed without so much as a whisper and the animals grunted and pulled up not twenty paces away from him. He blinked hard, not believing his eyes. He must be dreaming, but was he really that tired? He looked away and then looked back, but there he was. All red suits, white beards, red hats, and black boots. Ho, ho, ho! Hello there, young man. You must be Rose's father. He was frozen to the spot, both 
figuratively and literally it felt. As he stood there, speechless and dumbstruck. But then there came a sound which melted his soul in an instant. He could have picked it out of a storm. He heard his name being called, and it was the sound of Rose. Waving frantically from behind Santa Claus, and hurriedly clambering down from the sleigh, was his very own daughter. Her father dropped to his knees, sobbing with joy, his arms held open as his baby girl ran with all her might into them. He embraced her and hugged her so hard he wasn't sure his heart could take any more. But he dared look for a mere moment, only to see his beautiful wife close behind her, cradling none other than Morag. Seeing his rock, his support, mother of Rose, mother of their child-to-be, and his darling wife coming to him, crumbled him into an emotional wreck. And together, as a whole family, they huddled in a great embrace in the middle of Gapstone Bridge. Santa Claus looked on from his sleigh, cheeks rosy, a wee tear rolling down one of them as he savoured the scene before him. Christmas really was about only one thing, after all, and this proved that fact more than anything. He let them be, hardly wanting to disturb them from their embrace. After a wee while, they all looked up from each other, a sea of puffy eyes and sniffling smiles. Rose's father held his wife tightly around the waist, looking into her eyes with all his love. Whilst Rose stooped to pick up Morag from the snow, her paws must have been feeling the cold a wee bit. They all turned to Santa, expressions full of cheer. Right you lot, let's get you all home safe. That's enough for one night. You've got your old Santa Claus bubbling away himself over here. Where's Mrs. Claus when you need her? But before we get you home, we've got a wee bit more work to do. So, all hands on deck. We've still got half the world to visit, you know. And some very special people in Kentucky, Seattle, Portland... Los Angeles and Temecula. What do you say, everyone? Are you all ready? The happy family nodded cheerily and proceeded to shuffle over to the sleigh, glued to each other, never wanting to let go. With one final wiggle of the reins, the reindeer pulled Santa Claus, Rose, her parents, the bun in the oven, and of course, Morag the cat, zooming across the snow 
of Central Park, and back up into the starry night sky of New York City. To every one of them, it was a Christmas miracle. And the best Christmas they'd ever had. Oh!